The concept of an elephant graveyard is a widely accepted idea among the general population that's believed by most experts to be an urban legend. According to the legend, elephants nearing the end of their lives instinctively travel to a hidden location to die, leaving behind vast quantities of ivory and bones. The myth of the elephant graveyard is often linked to the scramble for Africa in the 19th century, where European explorers and hunters were told of mysterious sites filled with elephant remains. Some stories suggest that the elephants are drawn by a supernatural force to these graveyards, where they die peacefully, leaving behind a treasure trove of ivory. One notable legend places a specific graveyard on or near the base of Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. European explorers in Africa may have encountered elephant remains near water sources or other specific areas where the animals tended to gather. The clustering of bones in such places may have been mistaken for intentional burial sites, reinforcing the myth of a designated elephant graveyard. However, natural causes such as food scarcity and the search for water are more likely reasons why elephant remains are sometimes found in groups. That said, elephants are known to exhibit a strong connection to their dead, which has further fueled speculation about the existence of graveyards. These intelligent animals have been observed engaging in behaviors that resemble human mourning, such as touching and inspecting the bones of deceased elephants. This sensitivity to death may have contributed to the myth with some accounts describing how elephants return to the remains of their kin, even after weeks have passed. Some elephant researchers have even gone so far as to suggest that these elephants are engaging in ritual funerary practices, again strengthening the idea of designated elephant graveyards. Also, of course, I have to reference it here. I first came across the idea of an elephant graveyard in The Lion King as a kid, and I'm sure a lot of you did as well. And as a quick editorial note until I researched this topic, I was 100% certain that elephant graveyards were entirely factual. Phil Collins' iconic 1981 song, In the Air Tonight, has been surrounded by a persistent urban legend since its release. This myth revolves around the idea that the song's lyrics narrate a dark and personal experience involving a drowning incident. According to the urban legend, Collins witnessed a man who could have saved someone from drowning, but chose not to intervene. Supposedly, Collins was too far away to actually intervene, but close enough that he saw the entire event unfold. The story goes further claiming that Collins later invited the man responsible to one of his concerts, pointed him out in the audience, and sang the song directly to him as a form of public shaming. This tale, while dramatic, has no basis in reality, and despite the legend's gripping nature, Collins has repeatedly denied that the song is based on any such event. He has clarified that the song was written during a period of emotional turmoil following his divorce and the lyrics reflect his feelings of anger and bitterness, not a literal experience. One of the reasons this urban legend continues to thrive is likely due to Eminem's song Stan, featuring a verse that very directly references the myth. Funnily enough, Collins has remarked that people often approach him, believing they know the song's true backstory, only to be disappointed when he tells them it's a work of fiction. The theory that Elvis Presley made a cameo in Home Alone has emerged as a popular urban legend in the last decade or so. This theory revolves around a specific background character in the airport scene where Kevin's mother, Kate, is attempting to return home to her son. In this scene, an extra with a distinctive beard and thick hair stands behind Kate, and some believe that this man is none other than Elvis Presley who supposedly faked his demise in 1977 under this theory. Elvis theorists have pored over this scene, citing various physical resemblances between the man in question and what Elvis might have looked like had he been alive in 1990. Some go so far as to analyze the movements of the extra, particularly the way he slightly tilts his head, 
which they claim mirrors Elvis's signature stage mannerisms. Supporters of the theory also draw attention to the broader circumstances of the movie. Director Chris Columbus had directed Heartbreak Hotel just before making Home Alone, a film centered on a group of teens kidnapping Elvis to cheer up their mother. This link seems too convenient for some who believe Columbus was playfully planting an Easter egg for Elvis fans in his next project. Though the visual similarities are debatable, some people argue that other elements of the scene reinforce their belief. The bearded extra is dressed in a turtleneck, an item Elvis was known to wear frequently, especially in later years when he became self-conscious about his neck. The choice of wardrobe seems significant to those who believe Elvis was hiding in plain sight, covering up features that might otherwise make him more recognizable. Chris Columbus has addressed this theory in various interviews and audio commentaries. He acknowledges that some fans are convinced that Elvis is the man in the background, but he dismisses the idea by stating that the man is merely an extra. Another intriguing aspect of the theory involves the involvement of John Candy, who appeared in the same scene. Candy's character introduces himself as the Polka King of the Midwest, and some believe that placing the Polka King alongside the king of rock and roll was a deliberate move by the filmmakers. These small, seemingly coincidental details are seized upon by fans who see them as subtle nods to Elvis's enduring presence. In a 2020 interview, Home Alone cinematographer Julio Macat was asked about the Elvis theory. While he didn't confirm or deny it outright, he mentioned his belief that strange things can happen during filming and that he couldn't rule out the man in the film being Elvis. Personally, I've examined the scene and I can't fully rule out that the man seen in the scene isn't three cats sitting on each other's shoulders with a CGI overlay. But hey, that's just me. The Pop Rocks and Coke urban legend was widespread on schoolyards in the late 20th century. At its core, the story suggests that consuming the fizzy candy Pop Rocks and following it with a carbonated beverage like Coke could lead to a violent and fatal explosion in a person's stomach. While many versions of this legend circulated, the most famous one involves Little Mikey, a child actor from a popular Life Cereal commercial in the 1970s. Pop Rocks are carbonated candy that produces a popping sensation in the mouth when consumed. The candy's unique texture and its tendency to pop created the perfect conditions for myths to arise. Pop Rocks work because they contain small pockets of pressurized carbon dioxide, which is released when the candy dissolves. The myth capitalized on this reaction, falsely suggesting that combining the candy with soda would lead to an overproduction of gas in the stomach, enough to cause an explosion. Parents and children alike began to fear that mixing Pop Rocks with soda could result in serious harm. According to various accounts, the rumor became so widespread that the company responsible for Pop Rocks, General Foods, had to launch a public relations campaign to combat the misinformation. They bought full-page newspaper ads, contacted schools, and even sent the candy's inventor, William A. Mitchell, on a tour to reassure the public. Despite these efforts, sales of the candy dropped significantly, and Pop Rocks were eventually pulled from the market for a period of time in the early 1980s. But let's get back to the specifics of the urban legend that made this story so famous. Adding to the allure of the myth was the association with John Gilchrist, the actor who played Little Mikey. As the legend goes, Mikey consumed Pop Rocks and soda, leading to his demise via stomach explosion. This story spread so quickly and widely that Gilchrist's family was inundated with phone calls expressing condolences. General Foods even tried to use Gilchrist in a commercial to debunk the rumor, but his contract with Life Cereal prevented it. Despite the absurdity of the story, it was taken seriously enough that the FDA set up a hotline to answer consumer concerns. 
Also, before anyone asks, I was listening to the Green Day song Pop Rocks and Coke on repeat while I was researching and writing this section. Looking forward to seeing that one coming back around in my Spotify wrapped for this year. In Bulgaria, the phone number 0888-888888 has gained notoriety for its supposed curse, leading to a series of mysterious deaths associated with its owners. The cursed phone number was issued by the Bulgarian mobile phone company Mobitel. The first notable owner of the number was Vladimir Grashnov, the former CEO of Mobitel. Grashnov, who appeared to be in good health, died in 2001 from an aggressive form of cancer. Rumors suggested that his illness might have been caused by radioactive poisoning, allegedly orchestrated by business rivals. The next person to inherit the number was Konstantin Dimitrov, a well-known Bulgarian mafia boss. In 2003, while dining at a restaurant in Amsterdam, Dimitrov was ended by an assassin. The motives behind his slaying were linked to his involvement in trafficking illicit substances. The coincidence of his violent end further cemented the phone number's deadly reputation. Following Dimitrov, Konstantin Dishleyev, a real estate agent with alleged ties to the criminal underworld, received the number. In 2005, he was slain outside an Indian restaurant in Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria. After his death, Mobitel decided to suspend the number permanently. Anyone attempting to call it now hears a message indicating the number is outside network coverage. Various theories attempt to explain the curse associated with the number. Some suggest that the number itself is not cursed, but the individuals who owned it were involved in dangerous activities that led to their untimely ends. This explanation posits that the curse is more about coincidence and the high-risk lifestyles of its owners, rather than any supernatural force. Others believe that the number carries an inherent curse, perhaps tied to its string of eights. In numerology, the number eight is often associated with power and material success, but the addition of a zero has been suggested to invert this success. Across the world, there are numerous stories of cursed phone numbers. For instance, in Japan, an allegedly cursed number inspired the famous movie series, The Ring. On September 27, 2016, an eerie emergency alert system message was broadcast in upstate New York. This unusual message, which included the phrase, would you, could you, on a train, appeared during a test on WKTV, a local television station. The message immediately drew attention due to its cryptic nature and the peculiar coincidence that followed. Just two days later, on September 29, 2016, a tragic train accident occurred at the Hoboken Terminal in New Jersey. A New Jersey transit train, arriving from Spring Valley, New York, failed to stop and crashed into the terminal at high speed. The impact led to the tragic loss of one life and injured over 100 others. This incident coincided with the end date mentioned in the EAS message, which added to the mystery and speculation surrounding the broadcast. The crash investigation revealed that the train engineer, Thomas Gallagher, suffered from severe undiagnosed sleep apnea this condition likely contributed to his fatigue and inability to control the train properly. The National Transportation Safety Board concluded that Gallagher's undiagnosed sleep apnea and fatigue were the primary causes of the accident. The unusual coincidence between the cryptic EAS message and the train crash led to numerous conspiracy theories speculating some sort of foreknowledge of the accident. In the critically acclaimed game, Dark Souls, the pendant is one of the most mysterious items, sparking numerous theories and speculations since the game's release. The pendant can be selected as a starting gift or found in several in-game locations, including on a corpse or at the altar in the undead parish if certain conditions are met. Despite its mysterious allure, the pendant's actual in-game function, or lack thereof, 
has been a topic of much debate and curiosity. When Dark Souls director Hidetaka Miyazaki suggested in an interview that he would choose either the pendant or nothing as a starting gift, it set off a wave of speculation among fans. This statement, coupled with the game's cryptic nature and deep lore, led players to scour every corner of the game for hidden meanings and uses for the pendant. The in-game description of the pendant states it has no effect, but fond memories comfort travelers, which didn't deter players from concocting elaborate theories. Some believed it was an heirloom connected to the game's lore, potentially linked to an extremely obscure character in the game's mythology. Others speculated that the pendant might unlock secrets on subsequent playthroughs or influence in-game events in subtle ways. When the pendant continued to have no effect or do anything, players came up with increasing arcane activities in an attempt to solve the puzzle of the pendant. Adding fuel to the fire, Miyazaki later admitted that his endorsement of the pendant was partly intended as a prank. In a 2012 interview, he revealed that the pendant was meant to play with players' expectations and curiosity. This revelation was met with a mix of frustration and admiration from the fan base, who had invested considerable effort into deciphering its purpose. Despite this, some fans believed that the real prank pulled by Miyazaki was coming out and saying the pendant did nothing, even though it actually did. These players continued to investigate usages for the pendant, but at this point, it appears to be completely accepted that the pendant indeed does nothing. In 1996, workers at the GMC Delphi Interior and Lighting Plant in Anderson, Indiana, encountered an unusual phenomenon. Small, squid-like creatures in a sludge pit containing a mixture of oil, antifreeze, and automobile parts. These oil pit squids, as they came to be known, were approximately six to eight inches long and grayish red in color. The workers allegedly managed to capture one of these creatures in a jar but it mysteriously disappeared soon after. Despite this bizarre sighting, there was little concrete evidence to substantiate the existence of these squids, leading to speculation about their origin and nature. Some have proposed that these creatures could be a type of mutated earthworm or other simple life form adapted to the toxic environment. Others suggested more exotic theories including the possibility that these are alien entities which are able to live in extreme environments. A more down-to-earth suggestion is that these are an unknown creature from the ocean depths, capable of handling extreme environments. At present, it doesn't appear that there has been any further sightings of this creature past 1996, and as such it appears to likely just be an urban legend. The story of the vanishing village of Lake Anjikuni is one of the most enduring urban legends to come out of Canada's remote Arctic region. Located near the lake in the Kivalik region of what is now Nunavut, the village was reportedly inhabited by a group of Inuit people until one day in November 1930, when they seemingly disappeared without a trace. Joe LaBelle, a seasoned fur trapper, stumbled upon the village while seeking shelter only to find it eerily deserted. LaBelle, who had been familiar with the village, arrived expecting the usual warm welcome from the Inuit inhabitants. Instead, he found the village completely abandoned. No signs of struggle were apparent. The villagers had left behind food, tools, and even personal belongings, as though they had vanished suddenly and without warning. Fires were still burning and meals were left unfinished, adding to the growing sense of dread as LaBelle explored the area. Even the village dogs, a crucial part of Inuit life, had been found starved, further adding to the mystery. The events that followed LaBelle's discovery only deepened the mystery. After rushing to report his findings, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police launched an investigation. Although there were reports of disturbed graves in the village's cemetery, with headstones neatly stacked beside them, the RCMP could not determine what had happened to the inhabitants. 
No footprints or tracks were found, making it difficult to trace where or how the villagers might have left. The lack of evidence led to speculation, with some suggesting supernatural explanations. Over time, the story became more fantastical as theorists tied the story to extraterrestrial encounters. UFO sightings were rumored in the area, with one trapper claiming to have seen a large cylindrical object over the lake, which then shifted into a bullet-like shape before disappearing. Such accounts fueled theories of extraterrestrial abduction, a notion that, though unproven, has fascinated UFO enthusiasts ever since. Despite these far-reaching speculations, the story of the Lake Anjakuni disappearance has never been conclusively explained. Even the RCMP, after an exhaustive investigation, could offer no official explanation. Over the years, Details about the population size of the missing village have varied, with some reports claiming that hundreds, even thousands, of people disappeared. However, most sources estimate the village's population to have been closer to 30, casting doubt on some of the more sensational retellings. One possible explanation for the sudden disappearance revolves around a harsh Arctic winter. Some suggest that the Inuit villagers may have left their homes in search of better conditions, but why they would have abandoned essential supplies or left in such haste remains a mystery. Others theorize that the villagers may have been displaced by a natural disaster, though no evidence of such an event has been found in the area. Notably, the modern RCMP has officially dismissed the case as either an exaggerated event based on routine migration of Inuit populations or as a complete fabrication, an urban legend. Further, the RCMP claims that they don't have any records of the event being reported to them, though they do admit that record keeping in the area at the time was spotty at best. Some skeptics believe that the story was entirely made up with the original story being traced back as far as a near contemporaneous newspaper in Virginia of all places. That said, Joe LaBelle, the fur trapper, is accepted to be a real person, and the possibility that the story did happen largely as reported remains. Another set of believers believe that the entire thing is a mass alien abduction incident, which was covered up by the Canadian government and the RCMP. This formulation provides a convenient explanation for why no contemporary RCMP records exist of the event. Whether the Lake Anjakuni disappearance is a mass mysterious disappearance, an alien abduction event, or a cleverly crafted urban legend remains to be seen. The image of lemmings mindlessly hurling themselves off cliffs has become an enduring urban legend symbolizing unthinking conformity to group thought. Lemmings are small rodents found in the Arctic regions of North America and Eurasia. They're known for their fluctuating population cycles, which can lead to sudden increases in their numbers very rapidly. These population booms have fascinated observers for centuries, giving rise to various myths and legends about their behavior. In the Renaissance period, some scholars speculated that the creatures took drastic actions to reduce their populations when their population levels became unsustainable. The modern urban legend of lemmings leaping off cliffs gained significant traction in the 20th century. A pivotal moment in the spread of this myth was the 1958 Disney quote-unquote documentary White Wilderness. In this film, Lemmings were depicted in a dramatic scene where they plunged off a cliff into the ocean. The narration suggested that this was a natural behavior linked to population control. The documentary won an Academy Award, lending credibility to its portrayal. Notably in 1982, an investigative journalism program in Canada called The Fifth Estate aired a program which debunked the movie. In this program, it was revealed that the producers of the film had transported the lemmings to a set location and repeatedly shoved them off a cliff, portraying this as a factual event. 
The myth was further perpetuated by various media references over the years. For instance, the video game Lemmings, released in 1991, featured small lemming-like creatures mindlessly marching to their doom unless the player intervened. This game popularized the lemming stereotype among a new generation, reinforcing the idea of lemmings as symbols of blind conformity and self-destructive behavior. The Babysitter and the Man Upstairs is a chilling urban legend that has been told and retold over decades, evolving with each iteration. The legend typically involves a babysitter receiving unnerving phone calls that escalate in threat, culminating in the revelation that the calls are coming from inside the house. The tale is believed to date back to at least the 1960s, though it may have earlier roots. One of the most commonly cited inspirations is the tragic case of Jeanette Chrisman, a 13-year-old girl who was babysitting in Columbia, Missouri in 1950. On a stormy night, she faced a terrible fate that has since been linked to this urban legend. The specifics of her story, a young girl, a vulnerable situation, and a home invasion mirror the core elements of the babysitter and the man upstairs legend. The urban legend has influenced a variety of media and has been adapted into movie form on a number of occasions. These films encapsulate the terror of being watched and the invasiveness of the home being breached, themes central to the legend. The legend also reflects societal anxieties, particularly around the roles and vulnerabilities of teenage girls. Babysitting, a common job for teenage girls, represents a transitional phase of independence and responsibility. Both parents and the teenagers themselves express a certain uncertainty about being in an unfamiliar environment. The story often serves as a cautionary tale about the dangers lurking in seemingly safe environments, emphasizing the importance of vigilance and caution. The urban legend of the Headlight Flash Gang initiation has circulated for decades, particularly in the United States and Canada. This narrative involves a gang initiation ritual where prospective members drive at night without their headlights on. If an unsuspecting driver flashes their lights to signal that the gang member's headlights are off, it allegedly triggers the initiation rite. According to the myth, the gang member is then required to pursue the helpful driver and slay them as part of the initiation process. The legend first gained traction in the early to mid 80s particularly during a period when gang violence was a heightened concern in many U.S. cities. The myth often resurfaces in times of societal unease, frequently being shared through chain emails, social media posts, or by word of mouth. Despite its repeated debunking by law enforcement agencies and myth-busting websites, the story continues to spark fear. What makes this urban legend so powerful is its adaptability. Versions of the story have been tailored to local contexts, with specific highways or neighborhoods often mentioned, making the threat seem more immediate and real. The myth taps into the existing fear of crime in big cities and reinforces a sense of vulnerability while driving, an activity that typically represents personal autonomy and safety. It also plays on the basic social instinct to be helpful. Flashing your headlights is a universal signal of goodwill, yet the legend corrupts this simple act into one of life-threatening risk. The Death by Coconut legend is a classic example of how an extremely unusual and rare occurrence can evolve into a widely believed myth. According to the urban legend, more people are killed each year by falling coconuts than by shark attacks with the statistic often cited as 150 deaths annually. However, while documented cases of coconut-related deaths do exist, the scale has been exaggerated over time. The origin of this urban legend can be traced back to a 1984 paper titled Injuries Due to Falling Coconuts, which was based on research conducted in Papua New Guinea. This study highlighted the dangers posed by falling coconuts 
noting injuries and fatalities associated with these incidents. The study found that falling coconuts could result in serious injuries like skull fractures and worse, especially in tropical regions where coconut trees are abundant. However, the study never claimed that 150 people died globally from coconuts annually, and the author was only able to find a few accounts of these events. In 1777, for example, King Tetui of Mangaya in the Cook Islands reportedly lost a concubine when a green coconut fell on her head. However, this case is poorly documented, and some have argued this could be a euphemism for something worse. Other examples include a U.S. Marine who died in 1943 while sleeping beneath a coconut tree on Guadalcanal, and several tragic incidents in Sri Lanka and India. These individual cases, though rare, underscore the potential danger posed by coconuts when they fall from heights of up to 100 feet. Cow tipping, an activity often depicted in pop culture, involves the supposed activity of sneaking up on unsuspecting upright cows and pushing them over for amusement. Cow tipping generally relies upon the assumption that cows sleep standing up and a group sneaks up on the standing cow during the night, tipping it over. However, the idea that cows sleep standing up, which is central to the concept, is incorrect. Cows actually sleep lying down, not standing up, and they are far more aware of their surroundings than the myth assumes. They can detect threats and disturbances from considerable distances and are capable of waking quickly from sleep. This natural vigilance makes the stealth approach described in cow tipping tales highly improbable. Further, the physical logistics of cow tipping debunks the myth that this is a common or routine event. Cows are large, heavy animals, typically weighing around 1,500 pounds. They have a low center of gravity and sturdy, wide-set legs that provide a great degree of stability. Physically tipping a cow would require immense force, much more than what a few people could generate. One study suggests that it would require up to six strong people to exert the necessary force simultaneously. That said, this doesn't mean cow tipping is impossible or has never been pulled off before, but rather that it's not the common rural occurrence that it's often portrayed as. For instance, if you got together the six strongest seniors on the local high school football team, I'm betting that the cow unfortunately wouldn't stand a chance. Another element of cow tipping suggests that cows meet their demise upon their stomachs becoming entangled during the tipping process. However, there's no indication that the act of tipping these creatures would cause such a stomach tangling issue. This doesn't mean that cow tipping is risk free for our bovine friends. It's absolutely not. Given their immense weight, if a group was able to tip one over, it would almost certainly sustain fractures. In my view, cow tipping isn't a complete urban legend, much like many of the other topics on the iceberg, but rather the urban legend is how common it is and the results of tipping the cow. Also calling it now, I'll get a ton of comments from people who will swear their cousin tipped a cow back in the day but no comments from anyone who actually tipped one themselves. Hey everyone, it's Jimmy here. Just reminding you to like and subscribe and to hit the notification bell. Also, if you're enjoying the video so far, don't forget to hit the share button and send my video to your friends and family. The myth that Twinkies never rot and could survive the apocalypse has persisted for decades likely fueled by the snack's remarkable longevity compared to typical baked goods. Twinkies are widely believed to be imperishable, immune to decay, and therefore an ideal candidate for surviving extreme conditions, such as a nuclear apocalypse. Twinkies are made with a combination of artificial and natural ingredients, including sugar, flour, and eggs, but they are also packed with preservatives, such as sorbic acid, that extend their shelf life. 
Originally, Twinkies had a shelf life of just 26 days, but following a reformulation, this was extended to 45 days. Although six weeks is either impressive or disgusting depending on your perspective, it's far from the decades-long lifespan that the myth suggests. The idea that Twinkies can last indefinitely may have originated from a series of curious informal experiments that were reported on by media outlets. For instance, a Maine teacher allegedly kept a Twinkie on his desk for over 30 years. Though the cake had hardened, it retained its form, seemingly unchanged, sparking rumors of Twinkie's immortality. Another urban legend suggests someone decided to keep a Twinkie out until it showed signs of mold, which allegedly took just over eight years. Known in Mongolia as Olgoi Korkoi, which translates to intestine worm, the Mongolian death worm is reputed for its deadly capabilities and elusive nature. The creature is described as resembling a cow's intestine, a sausage-like entity, approximately two feet long, devoid of a discernible head or legs. Legends assert that mere contact with this being results in instant demise, a claim that underscores the fear and respect it commands within the Gobi's vast landscapes. Historical accounts of the Mongolian death worm date back to the early 20th century, when Western explorers first documented local tales of this fearsome entity. The most notable of these was Roy Chapman Andrews, whose encounters with Mongolian officials in the 1920s revealed a profound belief in the worm's existence, despite no physical evidence. These officials described it minutely, with one even claiming knowledge of a man who had seen the worm and survived to recount his tale. Despite numerous expeditions aimed at uncovering the truth behind this legendary creature, concrete evidence of its existence remains elusive. Notably, Czech cryptozoologist Ivan Makerly dedicated significant portions of his life to this quest, employing innovative methods inspired by the novel Dune. And when I'm saying a significant portion of his life, Makerly conducted three full expeditions to Mongolia taking place in 1990, 1992, and 2004. Speculation on the death worm's biological nature has led some to suggest it could be a misidentified or yet to be discovered species. Common speculation includes a type of limbless lizard or skink adapted to the desert's harsh conditions. Others propose it might share characteristics with known venomous creatures, capable of spitting venom or emitting electric shocks to incapacitate its prey or defend itself. Given the vastness and emptiness of the Gobi Desert, and given that there is nothing inherently fantastical about the Mongolian death worm, some experts believe it could exist. The urban legend about litter boxes being installed in schools has captured the attention of the public in recent years. This myth first surfaced in late 2021 during a school board meeting in Michigan, where a claim was made that schools were providing litter boxes for students identifying as cats. Despite being swiftly debunked by school officials, this rumor continued to spread online and in various communities. Multiple school districts, including those in Michigan, Iowa, and elsewhere, have released statements to clarify that no litter boxes have ever been installed in their facilities. These clarifications, however, have not entirely stopped the spread of the myth, which continues to resurface in various places. One notable example of the legend's impact occurred in Indiana, where a high school social experiment unintentionally contributed to the spread of the litter box story. A group of students fabricated a story about a litter box to illustrate how quickly misinformation can go viral. The experiment succeeded in showing how easily narratives can take hold. However, it also led to confusion and the need for the school to issue an official correction that there were no sanctioned cat boxes. The Simpsons, the longest running American animated show, has gained a reputation for its alleged eerie ability to predict the future. With its debut in 1989, 
The show has produced over 700 episodes filled with satirical humor and often touching on real world issues. One of the earliest examples was in the 1992 episode, Lisa the Greek, where Lisa predicts the outcome of the Super Bowl, which came true just days after the episode aired. This pattern of predicting Super Bowl results continued successfully for several years, cementing the show's reputation for prognostication. In the episode Bart to the Future, which aired in 2000, a future Lisa Simpson becomes president of the United States and mentions inheriting a budget crisis from President Trump. This prediction seemed far-fetched at the time, but became reality when Donald Trump was elected president in 2016. In the episode Springfield, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Legalized Gambling, the characters parodying Siegfried and Roy are attacked by their trained white tiger. A decade later, Roy Horn was attacked by one of their tigers during a live show, leading to the end of their performances. An episode from 1998 featured a sign that read, 20th Century Fox, a division of Walt Disney Company. Nearly two decades later, Disney acquired 21st Century Fox in 2017, making this another striking prediction. The episode Lisa's Wedding predicted technology like video calling and smartwatches. Lisa speaks to Marge using a video phone, a precursor to FaceTime, which Apple introduced in 2010. Additionally, the show depicted a watch that could make phone calls, similar to the Apple Watch launched in 2015. Theories about how The Simpsons writers manage these predictions range from the plausible to the fantastical. Some believe it's simply a matter of probability and the law of large numbers. With so many episodes covering a wide range of topics, some are bound to coincide with future events. Some fans believe that the writers have inside information or are time travelers. Others speculate that the writers have a deep understanding of socio-political trends and extrapolate potential outcomes based on current events. However, believers argue that the predictions seem too specific and too numerous to be mere coincidences, and note that other similar shows don't display this pattern. The brown note is a concept often described as an infrasonic sound frequency so powerful that it can induce involuntary bowel movements in humans. This myth suggests that exposure to frequencies between 5 Hz and 9 Hz, well below the audible range for humans, could resonate with the body's internal organs, specifically the intestines. This resonance is said to cause a loss of control over bowel movements. Some have suggested that this physical sensation might explain some of the discomfort associated with powerful bass at concerts or near large subwoofers. That said, no evidence has ever been found to prove that the brown note exists. Infrasound in general can affect the human body in other negative ways. Prolonged exposure to low frequencies, especially at high decibel levels, can cause nausea, disorientation, and discomfort. The Pope Lick Monster, deriving from Kentucky folklore, resides near the Pope Lick Trestle. This creature, part man, part goat, and sometimes even part sheep, is said to reside beneath a railroad trestle bridge over Pope Lick Creek near Louisville, Kentucky. Over time, it has become a subject of legend with various stories attempting to explain its existence and malevolent behavior. Some stories suggest the creature is the result of a circus train accident that allowed a freak show specimen to escape, while others propose it might have origins in dark, supernatural forces. Another version posits it as a vengeful spirit or entity tied to the land itself, perhaps an amalgamation of local fears and the human penchant for creating monsters out of the unknown. Other theories propose that it is a local variation of the Wendigo. The legend suggests the creature can use voice mimicry to lure unsuspecting individuals onto the trestle, leading to tragic outcomes. 
Despite the trestle being an active railway line with heavy freight trains passing multiple times a day, the myth of the bridge being abandoned and safe to explore persists, often with fatal consequences. The physical and psychological danger posed by the trestle, coupled with the monster's lore, continues to attract thrill-seekers despite widespread warnings of the very real risks involved. But back to the dangers associated with the Pope Lick Trestle. This fictional urban legend unfortunately boasts an extremely real and horrifying body count. The tragic allure of the Pope Lick monster legend has led to several fatal incidents at the Pope Creek train trestle. In 1988, a 17 year old lost his life to an oncoming train and another individual was injured in the same attempt to traverse the trestle. Six years later, a man met his demise after his ATV flipped on the tracks, leaving him stranded in the path of an oncoming train. In 2000, a 19 year old's life was cut short after he fell from the trestle while hunting the goat man. He was struck by a passing train. Another incident occurred on April 23, 2016, when a 26 year old woman was struck and killed by a train in her quest for the monster. Her boyfriend narrowly escaped death by clinging to the trestle's edge. The dangers of the trestle were highlighted again on May 26, 2019, when a 15-year-old girl perished at the site. Her friend also suffered serious but non-life-threatening injuries in the same incident. While the Pope Lick monster may be an urban legend, the dangers associated with the Pope Lick trestle are clearly very real and well-documented. On September 27, 1989, an unusual event allegedly took place in Voronezh, a city in the Soviet Union, involving what many claim to be a UFO sighting. This incident has since become one of the most famous UFO cases in history due to the level of official attention it received. The incident reportedly began when a group of children in Voronezh claimed to have seen a small ball in the sky, which quickly transformed into a disc and landed in Yuzhny Park. From this disc, witnesses described seeing a nine-foot-tall, three-eyed alien accompanied by a robot-like entity. This bizarre event was first reported by the Telegraph Agency of the Soviet Union, TASS, and quickly captured both national and international attention. According to various accounts, the alien exited the craft, used a tube-like device to freeze a bystander in place, and then abducted a 16-year-old boy. Witnesses included not only children, but also some local civil servants who claimed to have seen the craft. The incident occurred during a period of heightened UFO sightings across Russia and the world, which added to the credibility for some and skepticism for others. Following the initial reports, the Soviet media and scientists took an unusual interest in the incident. The Soviet Scientific Commission launched an inquiry into the event, examining the landing site. They reported finding increased levels of the radioactive isotope cesium, though this finding was later downplayed by the vice rector of the University of Voronezh. Notably, the New York Times reported on the incident, reflecting the global intrigue it sparked. However, skepticism was rampant, with some attributing the event to mass hysteria. Another theory suggests that the Voronezh UFO incident could have been an elaborate hoax. Given the period's heightened interest in UFOs and the Soviet Union's isolation from Western media, some believe that pranksters staged the event to gain attention. This theory is supported by the lack of physical evidence and inconsistencies in witness testimonies. Another angle explores the psychological and socio-cultural factors at play. The late 1980s were a time of change and uncertainty in the Soviet Union, with the policies of glasnost, openness, and perestroika, restructuring, transforming society. These factors, combined with increased exposure to Western science fiction and UFO lore, could have influenced the perceptions and reports of those involved. Excalibur, the legendary sword of King Arthur, 
is one of the most iconic symbols in Arthurian legend, representing kingship, divine right, and heroism. Its name, believed to be derived from either Latin or Welsh, has come to signify more than just a powerful weapon wielded by King Arthur and is now known worldwide. The story of Excalibur is most famously linked to two key Arthurian legends, the Sword in the Stone and the Lady of the Lake. The former, popularized in the 12th century poem by Robert de Boron, describes how Arthur, a seemingly unknown boy, pulls the sword from a stone, proving his divine right to rule Britain. According to this legend, only the true heir to the throne could achieve this feat, and Arthur's success marked him as the rightful king. However, in other traditions, Excalibur is not the sword drawn from the stone. This version states that the sword in the stone, which Arthur initially uses, shatters in battle, prompting the wizard Merlin to lead Arthur to the Lady of the Lake. She presents him with Excalibur, a magical sword with supernatural powers. Excalibur is often depicted as having extraordinary qualities, with some traditions emphasizing that its blade could blind enemies with its brilliance or that it granted invincibility to its wielder. Its scabbard, rather than the sword itself, was considered even more powerful in some accounts. According to some legends, Arthur was told that as long as he had the scabbard, he could not be mortally wounded. Another significant aspect of Excalibur is its connection to water, a recurring theme in Celtic mythology, where lakes and rivers often serve as entrances to the other world. The sword's delivery by the Lady of the Lake and its return to the waters upon Arthur's death reinforces the idea that Arthur's reign was divinely sanctioned. As he lay dying after the Battle of Camlin, his famous final battle, Arthur instructed one of his most trusted knights to return Excalibur to the lake. According to legend, this knight, who differs depending on the telling, was tempted to keep Excalibur for himself, but eventually threw it back into the water. While Excalibur is widely regarded as a product of medieval romance, it may draw from earlier myths. Some scholars believe it shares characteristics with swords in Celtic mythology, such as the Irish sword Khaled Bolg. These swords often carried similar magical traits, such as unbreakable blades and the ability to vanquish enemies effortlessly. The search for the historical Excalibur often revolved around finding a real-life basis for the legendary sword of King Arthur to increase a British ruler's legitimacy. Notably, in 1191, the historical Excalibur was supposedly discovered at Glastonbury Abbey. However, rather than keeping this sword in Britain, Richard the Lionheart gave it as a gift to King Tancred of Sicily, a Norman ruler of Sicily and distant relation of Richard. Unfortunately, King Tancred died very soon after in 1194, and the fate of this version of Excalibur remains entirely unknown, having been lost for over 800 years. Seriously, Tancred, you had one job and you messed it all up. When someone gives you Excalibur, you put that somewhere safe. The Kidding Vor, also referred to as the Snake-Eating Cow, is a cryptid that is said to inhabit the forests of Cambodia and Vietnam. This elusive animal has been a subject of fascination for cryptozoologists and local folklore, often described as a cow-like creature with distinctive spiral-shaped horns. Despite the ongoing debate about its existence, the Kidding Vor has gained international attention due to the controversy surrounding its classification and the alleged physical evidence found over the years. The creature is typically portrayed as a bovid, similar in appearance to a small cow or buffalo, with notable twisting horns measuring around 45 centimeters in length. These horns, which resemble corkscrews, are a key feature of the animal's reported morphology. The fur of the kidding vor is said to be spotted, adding to its unusual and distinctive look. According to some accounts, the animal is believed to possess carnivorous tendencies, particularly a preference for snakes, which gave rise to its nickname, snake-eating cow. 
The first major report regarding the kidding boar came in the 1990s. Wolfgang Peter and Andreas Feiler, zoologists from Germany, discovered what were believed to be the horns of an unknown bovid species in a market in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. This led to the formal classification of the creature as Pseudo Navibo spiralis in 1994. Notably, this is one of very few cryptids which has been given a formal scientific name, which has been accepted by the mainstream scientific community, at least for a time. Following this, other horn specimens were collected and analyzed, further fueling speculation that this was indeed a newly discovered animal. However, controversy quickly arose as researchers began to question the authenticity of these horns. Several scientists examined the horns and found that they might have been manipulated or even fabricated from domestic cattle horns. DNA analyses conducted on these horns yielded conflicting results, with some studies suggesting that the horns came from cattle rather than a unique species. Despite these findings, the possibility of the kidding boar being a real, albeit rare, species has not been completely dismissed. The International Union for Conservation of Nature once listed the kidding boar as a critically endangered species, though it later removed the species from its database due to the lack of evidence. If the kidding boar does exist, it would likely be extremely endangered due to habitat destruction and overhunting in Cambodia and Vietnam. Deforestation and human encroachment have decimated populations of large mammals in these regions, and the same factors would pose a significant threat to any surviving members of this elusive species. The potential discovery of the kidding voir would have important implications for the cryptozoology community as well. The discovery of an entirely new large species living in a fairly densely populated area would provide some potential evidence of existence of other large cryptids in similar circumstances. The chronovisor is an alleged time-viewing device reportedly developed by Father Pellegrino Ernetti, an Italian priest and exorcist, during the mid-20th century. According to Ernetti, this device enabled users to view and hear events from the past, like a television tuning into events throughout history. The most sensational of these claims includes observations of Jesus Christ's crucifixion and other biblical events. Other notable historical figures and events, such as speeches by Roman Senator Cicero and the end of Julius Caesar, were also noted to be viewable. Ernetti's description suggests that the chronovisor worked through the use of specialized antennae made from mysterious metals, capable of capturing sound and light waves across the spectrum. This technology supposedly allowed it to record and project past events onto a screen making it less of a time travel device and more of a viewer into history. Despite the intriguing nature of Ernetti's claims, they have been met with significant skepticism and controversy. Critics have pointed out that no concrete evidence of the device's existence has ever been presented aside from the photographs. I've attached an image of Jesus in his final days, reportedly taken through the chronovisor by Ernetti himself. Some say that this image resembles a statue or a painting, but I'll leave that up to your interpretation. The debate over the chronovisor's existence is further complicated by the Vatican's secretive stance on the matter. While the Church has not confirmed the existence of such a device, a Vatican decree from 1988 threatening excommunication for its use. This has fueled speculation about its possible reality and potential misuse. However, skeptics noted that the decree may also have been issued to prevent deterioration of church doctrine. In his later years, amidst growing skepticism, Ernetti allegedly recanted his claims, stating that the stories about the chronovisor were fabricated. His confession, however, is disputed, and some believe it was coerced by the church, or factions within the church, that wanted to suppress this wondrous technology. Hey everyone, it's Jimmy just jumping in here one more time reminding you to like, subscribe, and share. 
Also, remember, if you want to take it to the next level, you can do so with the Patreon or with a YouTube membership. Benefits include occasional early access to new content and shoutouts, and just generally helping the channel continue. Le Loyon is a mysterious figure whose sightings have intrigued and frightened residents of western Switzerland, particularly near the village of Mals. The name Le Loyon is not directly translatable in a meaningful way, as it appears to be a unique identifier or name given to this figure without a clear literal meaning in French. First reported around 2003, this individual is typically seen wearing a vintage gas mask and a long dark cloak. Le Loyon has been observed for over a decade, with sightings peaking in the early 2010s. The figure was first documented in local folklore, but gained wider attention when photographs and videos began surfacing online. An amateur photographer captured the first known image of Le Loyon in September 2013, which was later published by the Swiss news outlet Le Matin. Witnesses consistently described Le Loyon as a tall figure, over six feet in height, clad in heavy-duty boots and an antique gas mask that conceals their face entirely. Despite the eerie outfit, Le Loyon has never been reported to engage in violent or aggressive behavior. The true identity and motives of Le Loyon remain a mystery. Some believe Le Loyon is a hermit living a reclusive life in the woods, avoiding human contact in modern society. This theory suggests the figure might be a survivalist or someone who has chosen to live off the grid. Another popular theory is that they might be suffering from a mental illness, which compels them to dress in such an unusual manner. Authorities have expressed interest in finding this individual, partly out of concern for their well-being and to address the fear they instill in the community. Some speculate that Le Loyon could be hiding a physical disfigurement or skin condition. The gas mask and cloak could serve as a means to conceal their appearance and avoid unwanted attention. Given the figure's ghostly demeanor and the lack of clear logical explanations, some locals and enthusiasts believe Le Loyon might be a supernatural entity. One local resident described an encounter where Le Loyon emerged silently from the woods, only to stare briefly and then walk away without a word. Another incident involved a family who stumbled upon the figure, causing the children to flee in terror. In another story, Le Loyon was seen clutching a bouquet of flowers, adding a bizarrely gentle twist to the otherwise frightening encounters. The Monopoly Man, often envisioned with a monocle, has sparked widespread discussion due to the Mandela Effect, a phenomenon where a large group of people shares a false memory. Despite the common belief, the Monopoly Man, officially known as Uncle Pennybags, has never been officially depicted with a monocle since his debut in 1936. Proponents of this Mandela effect state that two realities merged, one where the Monopoly man wears the monocle and another one where the Monopoly man does not. In popular culture, there are only a couple of stock characters that are associated with the usage of the monocle. The first, which does not apply to the Monopoly man, is that of a stern German aristocrat from the ancient aristocracy. This image is generally associated with World War I. The second is the American blue-blooded aristocrat, often depicted wearing a top hat and carrying a cane. While this stock character has long since fell out of fashion, the popular planter's peanut mascot lives on, donning a monocle, top hat, and cane. Werewolves are creatures who transform from human to wolf, often under the influence of the full moon. The word werewolf itself originates from an old English term which combines weir, meaning man, and wolf, meaning, well, I'll let you guess what that term means, to describe a man-wolf hybrid. Stories of such transformations are spread across many cultures, but they are most commonly associated with European folklore dating back to at least the medieval period. The belief in werewolves, or lycanthropes, is intertwined with ideas of magic, curses, and religious interpretations, 
particularly in the Christian tradition. In early narratives, becoming a werewolf was often portrayed as a form of divine punishment. For instance, the legend of the werewolves of Ossory in Ireland tells of a clan cursed by St. Patrick for their defiance, transforming them into wolves for seven years as retribution. In medieval Europe, werewolves were frequently associated with the devil and accused of malevolent acts. The peak of werewolf hysteria coincided with the witch trials of the 16th and 17th centuries. Werewolves were often mentioned in these trials, particularly in parts of Germany, France, and Switzerland. Like witches, individuals accused of lycanthropy were subject to brutal interrogations and executions. However, the trials for werewolves were far less frequent than those for witches. The lore of werewolves includes a wide range of regional variants. In France, for instance, the Loup Garou was a prominent figure in local folklore. These werewolves were believed to be individuals who transformed into wolves as a punishment for their sins or due to a curse. The idea of transforming into a wolf by a curse or bite, particularly under the full moon, became a common trope especially in later interpretations and adaptations of the myth. In fiction, werewolf stories have been a popular topic for almost a millennium now. Medieval tales like Bisclavre, a 12th century narrative by Marie de France, laid the foundation for modern werewolf literature. In this now little known but highly influential story, a nobleman transforms into a wolf but retains his human intelligence and character. Modern portrayals often depict werewolves as tragic figures, cursed to uncontrollably transform during the full moon and struggling to retain their humanity. Modern sightings of werewolves, though rare, have been reported around the world, particularly in rural areas. In the United States, for example, Michigan's Dogman has been a subject of fascination since the late 19th century. Further skinwalkers, while not being werewolves in the strict sense, are said to sometimes transform themselves into wolves or dog-like creatures. Yeah Yeah Beebus 1 is a rumored game for the Nintendo Entertainment System, first mentioned in a mail-order video game service called Play It Again. It was subsequently referenced in a June 1989 issue of Video Games and Computer Entertainment magazine. Subsequent appearances of the game were noted in the Play It Again listings for July, August, and September 1989, with no further mentions of the game at any point. Despite extensive efforts, no physical copy, gameplay footage, or credible mention in any official gaming publication was found. The lack of evidence led many to believe it was a hoax, a typo, or a copyright trap. In 2021, a user from the Lost Media Wiki forums, known as Stinter Galactic, had a discussion with Neil Levin, a co-founder of Play It Again. During this conversation, Levin confirmed that they intentionally added false listings to identify imitators. While it's now generally accepted that no such game ever existed, the urban legend grew throughout the years, and a game studio made an unofficial sequel. I'll let you guess what they called it. Also, I suppose if it was never a real game to begin with, it's not really an unofficial sequel, is it? The Akanami, a creature stemming from Japanese folklore, is recognized chiefly for its unique habit, licking filth and grime from unkempt bathrooms and derelict buildings. This creature, which translates literally to filth liquor, is depicted traditionally as an impish entity with a long protruding tongue, dedicated to cleaning away dirt and dust, supposedly with poisonous saliva. It's capable of fitting in one's hand with greasy hair, webbed limbs, and a particularly long, sticky tongue used for its unique diet of muck and grime. Often depicted as a deterrent for poor hygiene, particularly among children, 
The creature carries an underlying message promoting cleanliness and sanitation. This creature's preference for inhabiting filthy areas like dirty restrooms or abandoned homes turns it into a peculiar custodian of cleanliness, ironically signifying neglect and the dire need for hygiene in its chosen environments. Despite its unsettling appearance and habits, the Akaname is not typically seen as dangerous, but rather as an eerie reminder of the importance of not letting things get dirty. Historically, the Akaname's origin might tie back to superstitions surrounding the public bathhouses of ancient Japan, where poor hygiene could lead to disease outbreaks. In Stevens Point, Wisconsin, Boy Scout Lane is a road that has terrified locals for generations due to a particularly disturbing urban legend associated with it. At the heart of Boy Scout Lane's lore is a tragic event purported to have occurred many years ago involving a troop of Boy Scouts. The narrative, though varied in detail, consistently speaks to a disastrous outing that led to the untimely demise of the Scouts under different harrowing circumstances. One version tells of a catastrophic fire, ignited accidentally, engulfing the Scouts in flames during a camping trip. Another recounts a chilling scenario where the group's bus meets a tragic end, leading to their collective demise. Further, a more sinister variant suggests they fell victim to their trusted scoutmaster who ended them all in a horrific event. What follows these alleged tragic events is a series of paranormal phenomena attributed to the spirits of the deceased scouts. Visitors and locals alike report an array of supernatural experiences. Some report spectral lantern lights seen bobbing through the darkness. Others report eerie sounds of footsteps and breaking branches from unseen entities. But perhaps the most chilling sight is the sight of a ghostly bus, reminiscent of the one the scouts were last seen alive on during their trip. These latter accounts often include ghostly apparitions of the boys themselves, wandering the woods in eternal unrest. Despite its gripping narrative, there is no historical evidence supporting the initial tragic story associated with Boy Scout Lane. My investigations into public records and historical accounts have failed to unearth any incidents involving a Boy Scout troop meeting a tragic fate in the area. And let's be honest, if any of these supposed events happened, there would be numerous local and national news articles about this event at the time. This strongly suggests the tales associated with Boy Scout Lane are purely the product of local folklore. Skeptics have suggested that the most likely explanation is that sightings are the result of mass hysteria events or simply the power of suggestion when in the region. At any rate, Boy Scout Lane is an extremely eerie and isolated road, which when the urban legend overlay is added, could easily give rise to some spooky occurrences. The theory known as Dark Side of the Rainbow claims a fascinating synchronicity between Pink Floyd's 1973 album, The Dark Side of the Moon, and the 1939 film, The Wizard of Oz. According to enthusiasts, when the album is played alongside the film, numerous moments of apparent correspondence between the two emerge, creating a unique viewing and listening experience. This phenomenon was first brought to widespread attention through a detailed examination by journalist Charlie Savage, who coined the term Dark Side of the Rainbow. His findings sparked a surge of interest, leading to extensive analysis by fans. I found that three particular moments are routinely cited as proof of this theory. As the song Breathe plays, Dorothy is seen performing a tightrope-like walk. The lyrical mention of balance coincides with her careful steps, suggesting a thematic link between the song's message and Dorothy's actions at that moment. Time and Dorothy running. The transition in the film to Dorothy running away from home to save Toto aligns with the line, no one told you when to run from the song Time. This lyrical and visual pairing enhances the thematic resonance of the moment, 
with the concept of time and urgency reflected both in song and on screen. Brain Damage and the Scarecrow Scene. The album's track, Brain Damage, starts playing almost simultaneously with the movie's If I Only Had a Brain Scene. The song's lyrics, mentioning lunacy and paths, seem to mirror the Scarecrow's erratic behavior and quest for a brain. Despite these connections, Pink Floyd and their production team have consistently denied any intentional connection. David Gilmour, Pink Floyd's guitarist and vocalist, has dismissed the theory as the product of someone with, quote, too much time on their hands. Nick Mason, the band's drummer, humorously suggested that the album was actually based on The Sound of Music rather than The Wizard of Oz. Alan Parsons, an engineer on The Dark Side of the Moon, echoed these sentiments, stating that any synchronicity was coincidental. In favor of this, Parsons sought to end the theory once and for all by highlighting the technical impossibility of intentionally syncing the album with the film. According to Parsons, given the lack of VCRs at the time of the album's production, they could not have been synced up. That said, I know this is another urban legend that people will swear by. And let's be honest, this one actually has some good points in its favor. But if Dark Side of the Rainbow were actually true, why would no one in the band have admitted to it at any point in the 50 plus years since the release of the album? Also, I just did some quick math in my head and realized we're much further from the release of Dark Side of the Moon than Dark Side of the Moon was from The Wizard of Oz when released. The Haunting of 30 East Drive in Pontefract, England is among the most infamous poltergeist cases in the UK. The story began in August 1966 when Joe and Jean Pritchard along with their children, Philip and Diane, moved into the seemingly idyllic house. Shortly after moving in, the Pritchards reported cold gusts of wind despite the warm weather, mysterious white powder falling from nowhere, and pools of water appearing inexplicably in the kitchen. These occurrences marked the beginning of their ordeal with what would later be known as the Black Monk. Over time, the disturbances grew more violent with objects being thrown, loud bangs resonating through the house, and physical attacks on family members. The entity's name, the Black Monk, derives from its appearance, a shadowy figure in a black habit resembling a monk. According to some sources, investigations into the house's history revealed that the site was near the location of a 16th century gallows where a monk met his end. This historical connection led many to believe that the Black Monk's restless spirit was tied to these tragic events. Throughout the years, the Pritchards continued to experience relentless paranormal activity. Diane Pritchard, in particular, seemed to be a focal point of the hauntings, experiencing hair pulling and being thrown from her bed. The family sought help from various sources, including the Catholic Church, which performed several exorcisms. Unfortunately, these attempts only seem to aggravate the spirit, resulting in more aggressive manifestations such as upside-down crosses appearing on walls. Paranormal investigators delved into the house's dark history, reinforcing the theory that the Black Monk was a tormented spirit from the nearby historical sites. Despite extensive investigations, including sessions with paranormal teams and ghost hunters, no definitive explanation for the phenomena at 30 East Drive has been found. The haunting of 30 East Drive has inspired numerous books, documentaries, and even films. The 2012 movie, When the Lights Went Out, dramatizes the Pritchard family's experiences, bringing the story to a wider audience. Today, the house remains a popular destination for ghost hunters and paranormal enthusiasts. The current owner has continued to open the house to visitors, despite the continued reports of supernatural occurrences. Personally, I think it's nice to see a haunted house that's just a run-of-the-mill post-war duplex.
The Philadelphia Experiment is an event said to have taken place in 1943 at the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. It allegedly involved the USS Eldridge, a cannon-class destroyer escort, which was purported to have been rendered invisible to the naked eye as part of an experiment involving electromagnetic fields. The tale was popularized through a series of letters from a man named Carl Allen to astronomer Morris K. Jessup. Further, the legend has been spread through subsequent books and a movie that dramatized the events. According to Allen's account, the experiment was a demonstration of Einstein's unproven unified field theory, claiming that the ship teleported from Philadelphia to Norfolk, Virginia. The ship was then transported back to Philadelphia, leaving the crew affected in disturbing ways. Some reports included sailors becoming mentally unstable, suffering from severe nausea, or even being fused with the ship's structure. However, these accounts lack corroboration and are dismissed by many as fantastical or outright fabrications. The origin of the story can be traced back to Jessup's correspondence with Allen in the mid-1950s, following the publication of Jessup's book on UFO propulsion. Critics and skeptics have pointed out numerous inconsistencies and the lack of physical evidence supporting the story. Records indicate that the USS Eldridge was not in Philadelphia at the time the experiment supposedly occurred. Some plausible theories for the basic version of the story include real degaussing experiments which were conducted by the US Navy. These experiments theoretically made the ships invisible to magnetic anti-ship weaponry used by the Axis forces. Further investigation into Carl Allen, the man behind the claim initially, indicates that he made a career of spinning intricate stories. Despite all this, the Philadelphia experiment is still widely discussed as if it were a real event that took place, or at least as if it was an event that had some meaningful basis in reality. Unsinkable Sam, also known as Oscar during his time in German service, is one of the most interesting animal stories from World War II. This cat is said to have survived three shipwrecks, earning his legendary nickname. But before we delve deeper into Sam's story, it's necessary to consider what role cats played on ships. A ship's cat was a vital crew member traditionally kept on board vessels to control rodents. These cats help prevent damage to cargo, particularly food supplies, and protect the ship's structural integrity from gnawing pests. Rodents can also spread disease, so cats contribute to the overall health and safety of the crew. Additionally, ship's cats offer companionship to sailors, alleviating loneliness and boosting morale during long voyages. Further, their keen senses also serve as an informal early warning system for environmental changes or approaching dangers, adding another layer of security. But I digress. Let's get back to Unsinkable Sam. While the exact details of Sam's story have elements of myth and mystery, the core facts remain largely the same. Sam's journey began on the German battleship Bismarck, which was launched in 1939 and commissioned in 1940. Bismarck was one of the largest and most powerful battleships ever built by Germany. On May 18, 1941, Bismarck set sail on its first and only mission. During the Battle of the Denmark Strait on May 24, 1941, Bismarck engaged the British ships HMS Hood and HMS Prince of Wales. The engagement led to the sinking of Hood, but Bismarck was heavily damaged and eventually sunk three days later on May 27, 1941. Amidst the chaos, it is believed that Sam, a black and white cat, managed to survive. The story goes that Sam was found floating on a board by the British destroyer HMS Cossack. The sailors aboard Cossack took him in, and he quickly became the ship's mascot. Cossack continued its service, but on October 24, 1941, it was torpedoed by the German submarine U-563. The damaged ship was towed back to Gibraltar, 
but it sank four days later due to severe structural damage. Remarkably, Sam survived this ordeal as well and was found clinging to a piece of wreckage. He was then transferred to HMS Ark Royal, an aircraft carrier, but as you may have guessed, Sam's time on Ark Royal was short-lived. On November 14, 1941, Ark Royal was torpedoed by the German submarine U-81. Despite efforts to save the carrier, it sank the following day. Sam was again found floating on debris and was rescued. After this third shipwreck, Sam was given the name Unsinkable Sam. He was later transferred to HMS Legion and eventually retired to a seaman's home in Belfast. The story of Unsinkable Sam is not without its mysteries and skepticism. One of the main points of contention is the lack of concrete evidence and consistent records. While the tale is widely circulated and has become a popular wartime legend, there are no official naval records that confirm the presence of a cat named Sam on these ships. The story largely relies on anecdotal accounts and sailors' testimonies, which can sometimes be embellished over time. Another mystery surrounding Unsinkable Sam is his origin. Some versions of the story claim that Sam was originally named Oscar and was a ship's cat on Bismarck from the beginning. Others suggest that he was a stray picked up at some point before Bismarck's final voyage. Despite the uncertainties, the story of Unsinkable Sam has captured the imaginations of many. In the late 90s, Pokemon Fever took over the world, captivating the hearts and minds of children, many of whom now enjoy the series with their own kids. A series of schoolyard and early internet rumors emerged that would become legendary in their own right. These were the tales of the Poke Gods, mythical creatures said to be hidden within the game, far more powerful and elusive than any Pokemon listed in the official Pokedex. The origin of the Poke Gods rumor can be traced back to the playgrounds and early internet forums where players exchanged tips and tricks. Many of these rumors were backed up with the unerring authority of the quote-unquote Nintendo uncle. Every school in the 90s had at least one student who professed authority on Nintendo-related topics due to an unseen uncle who quote-unquote worked for Nintendo. But back to Poke Gods. Players claimed that certain actions, often elaborate and obscure, could unlock these supreme beings. Names like Pika Blue and Mew3 circulated, with each supposed Pokey God having its own backstory and set of powers that far exceeded the game's standard limits. What made the Pokey God's rumor so compelling was the grain of truth at its core. The rumors of one Pokey God, Mew, turned out to be true. If Mew could be hidden within the game's data, what else was waiting to be discovered? This question fueled the fire of speculation and the hunt for Poke Gods. These rumors were not just idle schoolyard chatter. They had a tangible impact on how players engaged with the game. Many wasted countless valuable childhood hours attempting to decode the secrets to unlocking these legendary creatures. Players often followed convoluted steps that ranged from performing specific in-game actions to exploiting supposed glitches. The mystery of the Poke Gods comes from the time in which the rumor spread. In the late 90s, internet access was not common, yet everyone who was there at the time remembers the same Poke God rumors floating around their schoolyard. It seems that every school had one kid who had a Pika Blue on his Game Boy at home. And no, you couldn't see it because his parents didn't allow friends to come over or he wasn't allowed to leave the house with the Game Boy, amongst other excuses. Okay, so that's it for the second part of the Urban Legends Iceberg. Let me know in the comments if there are any other specific urban legends you'd like to see me address in the next part of this series. This is such a broad topic, so feel free to suggest anything you think may fit from video game urban legends to something that's only known in your town or city.
If you liked this video, please do me a huge favor and click like and subscribe and also click the share button and send it to anyone who you think may enjoy it. Shout out to my patrons Iced Mocha, Kurt the Squirt, Monoxide Wendigo, Jeffer Metcalf, Z Volts, Courtney Hammett, Out of Gray's Mind, Cap, Dionysus, Silva Rose, Franz Tech, Unknown Delusions, Faye, Jack Russell, Boom Slang, Spookiest Becky, Vespertine, Metanova, Will Roan, Crab Nebula, and Blasphemous.